You put a schizophrenic in a brain machine, brain scan machine, that the left part of their brain lights up. They are talking to themselves. We knew that, but the front part of the brain is unaware of it. The front part of the brain does not talk to the left part of the brain. And that is one of the greatest sources of human suffering since, since we left the swamp. Think of it, schizophrenia, so common that it's part of, of Gothic novels. We now realize it's caused by a miswiring of the brain. And we can now even look at history. This is Joan of Arc. And there have been many, many volumes written about her. Most volumes say she was schizophrenic. But that's not quite right. She didn't have the symptoms of schizophrenia. And she was quite cogent. The transcripts of her interrogation are on the internet. You can actually read them. Very sharp young girl. She was a teenager. And she talked to God. Well, it turns out that if you have a temporal, uh, temporal lesion, epileptic temporal lesion, about 10, 20% of these people have what is called hyper-religiosity. They become hyper-religious. They see ghosts, demons, spirits everywhere. If it rains, it's because of punishment for something somebody did. And we think, though we cannot prove, that perhaps Joan of Arc suffered from hyper-religiosity. And using radio waves, we can actually induce this effect artificially. It's called the God Helmet. The God Helmet is a helmet you put on with a radio in the back, and it's used radio that excites that area of the brain, and you think you're in the presence of spirits. You get rapture. So scientists decided to put two people inside the God Helmet. One was an atheist, and the other one was a Catholic nun, to see whether or not you can shake their belief. For the atheist, they chose Richard Dawkins, the biologist. He was put in the God helmet, and he was later, he said, well, yeah, he felt like something was there, but nah, he's still an atheist. And they put the nun in the God helmet, and they asked her, did it shake your belief? And she said, no, because God created us with a radio in our brain to communicate to heaven. You know, you can't win. <laughs> Neither of them had their beliefs shaken. And then, for me, one of the big questions was super genius. Why is it that some people have photographic memories? One child had a bullet that went through the left temporal lobe. Another person dove into a swimming pool, bashed the left side of his brain, again the left temporal lobe, on the bottom of a swimming pool. Both of them emerged as super mathematical geniuses afterwards. Amazing. In fact, after tonight's lecture, when you go home, do not pick up a hammer. <laughs> do not hit yourself with the left temporal lobe trying to become the next Einstein. It doesn't work that way. However, this gentleman here has photographic artistic memory. He can take one helicopter ride over Hong Kong, London, and Manhattan, and draw the entire, entire landscape from memory after one helicopter ride. You can see it in Manhattan. In fact, I was just there this morning. I saw it this morning. Terminal 1, American Airlines. Next time you're there, look up in Terminal 1, American Airlines, and you will see a mural about 50 feet long. The entire panorama of Manhattan drawn from memory from simply one helicopter ride. How does it work? Well, we don't know, but we think photographic memory is different from ordinary memory. We used to think that the brain records memories, and then these memories fade away. All the textbooks say that our brain records, and then these memories just dissolve with time. Now we don't think so. We think that forgetting is a very complicated biochemical mechanism. And in these people, they record, but the forgetting mechanism is broken. In other words, they have forgotten how to forget. In other words, all of us have the capability of being these super mathematical artistic geniuses, except that in their brains, the erased mechanism is broken. They record and they record, but they never erase. 
And then the question is, what about geniuses of the past? Many of them have suffered from what we think Asperger's, a form of autism. We think the greatest scientist of all time, the greatest scientist who ever lived, was Isaac Newton. Even Einstein said that. But Newton was a strange man. <clears throat> Newton had no friends, no girlfriends, no boyfriends, just no friends at all. He was incapable of small talk. You would not want to invite him to a dinner party. And he created, when he was 23 years old, he created calculus, the universal law of gravitation and the binomial theorem. I mean, what were we doing when we were 23 years old, right? When he was 23 years old, he mapped out a whole, several branches of mathematics and physics. And Dirac, one of the greatest quantum physicists of all time, he never said hardly anything at all. And if you want to see somebody with Asperger's syndrome, just watch The Big Bang Theory on CBS television. <laughs> and then, the greatest genius of modern times, Albert Einstein. Did you know his brain is still with us? It's one of the strangest chapters in all of science. When Einstein died in 1955, the pathologist held Einstein's brain in his hand. And he had this existential shock realizing that in his hand was undisputed genius. So what did he do? He took it home. <laughs> he violated all the morality, the laws, everything. He took the brain home. He kept it in a cooler for 30 years in his, in his living room. He put, when he drove cross country, he put it in a mayonnaise jar when he drove Einstein's brain cross country. One of the strangest chapters, and the brain is now back at Princeton. And the brain is different, a little bit, but not so much, but we still don't understand the mystery of Einstein's genius. And then Freud can be reanalyzed now. Now that we can look into the mind, we can see whether Freudian psychology is correct. Freudian psychology is based on the idea that the mind has three parts. The ego, which you can actually localize, is right here behind your forehead. The libido, the pleasure center, which we localize, is right here, the nucleus accumbens. And the superego, the guilty conscience, we found that, that's right behind your eyeballs. It's true. You can actually see blood flows ricocheting between three centers of the brain. So, scientists were curious about the libido, the pleasure center. So they took a mouse. They hooked two electrodes to the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure center of a mouse hooked these two electrodes to a telegraph key, and the mouse hit the telegraph key twice a second, stimulating itself until it starved to death. Then they went up the scale, cat, dog. Finally, they put a dolphin. They hook a dolphin's pleasure center to electrodes, hook it up to an electrode. The dolphin, by swimming forward, could stimulate its own pleasure center. What happened? Well, the dolphin stimulated itself two times a second until it realized, I am dying. I will die. At that point, the dolphin stopped, got some food, and then came back and stimulated itself. <laughs> the dolphin's not stupid. <laughs> and then, the big question, what is consciousness? Well, you know, so many words have been written about consciousness. In fact, 20,000 papers have been written by philosophers and dreamers and ministers and psychologists. Everybody's written about consciousness. 20,000 papers. Never in the history of science have so many devoted so much time to produce so little. <laughs> but I'm a physicist. We look at consciousness differently. In fact, I give a new definition of consciousness in my book. A definition that looks at a continuum a continuum of consciousness, and I even give a numerical formula by which you can calculate how conscious something is. For example, animals. I believe that animals are conscious, but their consciousness is different from our consciousness. How many people here, by the way, have a cat at home? Raise your hand if you have a cat. Oh, quite a few people have a cat. Ever notice that when you come home at night, the cat comes up to you, purrs, and rubs its leg against you, and you say, oh, how affectionate. And then the cat goes, huh, 
and just stomps off. Ever notice that? Well, if you could put a brain scan on the cat's brain, what would the cat be thinking? First of all, when a cat comes up to you and rubs itself on your leg, it's putting a hormone on you, a scent, saying, this human is mine. I own this human. Other cats, stay away. This human is my property. And I've trained the human to feed me twice a day. <laughs> good human, good human. Very smart, feeds me twice a day right on schedule. And the cat then goes, huh, and goes stomping off. Why is that? Because the cat is descended from the wild cat. The wild cat is a solitary hunter. It's brain scanned which show that it is mainly involved with solitary hunting. That's why the cats are antisocial. And dogs, yes. How many people have a dog in this room? Wow, oh, even more. Well, when you come home, the dog slobbers all over you, right? <laughs> why? Because the dog thinks that you are a dog. Except you are the alpha dog. You're the top dog. Because what holds wolves together? The dog is descended, in fact, all dogs are descended from Canis lupus, the gray wolf. And what holds Canis lupus together? The top dog, the alpha male. That's what holds the pack together. That's why all the beta males and the gamma males obey the alpha male unquestionably. And so when a pup, when a pup first sees you, the pup says, Daddy, because the pup thinks you are the alpha male and you thought it was man's best friend. <laughs> so I believe that even if we have a definition of consciousness, that even a thermostat, a machine can be conscious. Machines register the environment like a thermostat. Thermostats regulate temperature. A flower, I think, has maybe 10 units of consciousness. So one unit of consciousness is one feedback loop, like a thermostat. 10 units of consciousness would be a flower. And then an alligator, the reptilian mind, would have maybe a hundred or so units of consciousness because they understand space. They understand where they're located in space. And then mammals would probably have thousands of units of consciousness because they have picking orders, social hierarchies, emotions. They have to know their place in animal society. And then we have the highest level. We are at level three. So what differentiates us from the animals? Animals understand space. They understand space better than us. Eagles can see space much better than we can. And social animals, yeah, they have packs, they have pecking orders, they have emotions like us. So why are we different? We're different because we see the future. Animals have no concept of tomorrow. Go home tonight, train your cat, Train your dog to understand tomorrow. <laughs> and you cannot do it. We, on the other hand, if we think it's getting cold, we say, ah, oh, winter's coming, we have to winterize the house, we gotta get a ticket to Florida, whatever you. When animals feel it's getting cold, they simply hibernate because it's instinctive. It's an instinctive mechanism. Now you may say to yourself, well, maybe I don't believe this theory of yours. There must be things that you cannot explain in your theory of consciousness, like, for example, humor, a joke. How can you possibly explain a joke in these three levels of consciousness? Well, think about it for a moment. Why is a joke funny? Because the brain is constantly scheming, planning, always looking into the future, independent of your will. You can't help it. So when you hear a joke, you complete the punchline by yourself. You automatically complete the punchline. And when the punchline is different, then you laugh. So let me give you some examples. In the White House, Teddy Roosevelt's daughter was known as a big gossip. And she used to say, if you have nothing good to say about other people, then please come sit next to me. <laughs> and W.C. Fields was once asked about, you know, social clubs for children. Is it good for them? And W.C. Fields says, clubs for children? Yes, I'm in favor of that, but only if kindness fails. <laughs> and then the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, except do it first. <laughs> so why are these quote funny? Because when you hear something that your mother told you, 
Your mother told you, if you have nothing good to say about other people, then don't say anything at all. You heard that a million times when you were growing up. And then you, you complete the dots. But then when the punchline is different, you then laugh. So even humor is a question of our brain planning, scheming, strategizing, looking into the future, which animals do not do. Animals live in the moment. They live by instinct. They appear to think, but only because instinct takes over. Now, of course, they do plan a little bit, but they can never see tomorrow or next week. And, well, I'm running out of time. I have a whole chapter about robot consciousness, but I'll have to skip this. We're running out of time. And at MIT, they're even making robots at level two, that is, conscious robots. Robots, by the way, are still at level one. That is, the intelligence of an alligator, the intelligence of a cockroach. But at MIT, they're trying to make headroads into level two consciousness, emotions. And then, the future. Like I said before, the President of the United States has stated that we must map the mind as the next big goal. The Genome Project has been an incredible revolution in medicine. You can't even think about medicine today without thinking about the genome. I had my genes read. BBC Television took some of my blood, sent it down to a Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, and I got back a disc. They mailed me a disc with most of my genes on it. So in the future, they'll also send you a connect home as well with all the pathways of your brain. And if that's true, then the question is, if you could then tape record thoughts, then perhaps the internet will become a brain net. The next evolution of the internet could be a brain net. A brain net where emotions, sensations, feelings are sent over the internet. Think of teenagers on Facebook. They will love it. I mean, think of it. The emotional memory of their first date, the senior prom, their first kiss, all of that on Facebook. You'll explode. Children already put these little happy faces. They put these little happy faces on their email messages. Think of what could happen when you could put an entire memory. And then, I believe that one day, this is now maybe 100 years from now, once we have the genome, once we have the connectome, perhaps we'll send it into outer space. If you put our connectome on a laser beam, the laser beam can go to the moon in one second. One second. You can send somebody's consciousness right to the moon. That would revolutionize the space program. No more booster rockets. No more accidents. Ever saw that movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock? No more accidents in outer space. Meteors, radiation, weightlessness, meteor impacts. Boom, one second, you're on the moon. And so perhaps, just perhaps, it might be possible one day to explore the universe, maybe in the next century, as consciousness. Now, I'm running out of time because I'd like to take Q&A, but what I'd like to do now is end on a final story. When I was a child, I had a role model and that was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times I've memorized it, so why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, I will be the great Einstein, and you will put a cap on and a uniform, and you will be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. up to Q&A, and afterwards, uh, well, uh, for, for the select few, I'll be signing some books. And remember that after I sign your book, you can go to eBay and auction it off for money. <laughs> I think it's just worth something, so you can actually make money today. So anyway, we have some questions, so um, 
Let's see, the organizers have some questions from the audience. bring those questions with me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, for memory then, I'll try to tell you what some of the questions that came. I had I get a chance to have a sneak preview of some of the questions. One of the questions was about Moore's Law. Moore's Law said the computer power doubles every 18 months. Well, that's great. That's why we have all these goodies in our living room. iPods, iPads, tablets, the internet, GPS, apps, everything comes from Moore's Law. But the question was, won't Moore's Law eventually stop? Won't everything crash? Won't Silicon Valley turn into a rust belt when Moore's Law flattens out? And then what? Well, yes, it turns out that Moore's Law will eventually flatten out. It's slowing down now. You see, we are making transistors so tiny that they're smaller than, than cells. Pretty soon, they're going to be as small as, small as molecules. At that point, Moore's law breaks down. Silicon cannot sustain calculations at the molecular level. In other words, Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. The age of silicon could end. And let me ask you a question. Would you buy a new computer knowing that it's exactly the same as last year's model? No. The whole industry could collapse. That's why we physicists are desperately trying to create the next generation. The next generation beyond is a generation when we have molecular transistors, maybe even atomic transistors, maybe even quantum transistors. We don't have them yet, but we think that we better do it because in 10, 15 years, Moore's Law is gonna slow down. And perhaps a new Silicon Valley, a new Silicon Valley will rise up because Moore's Law is beginning to slow down. Another question, by the way, if you have a question that is urgent, you can raise your hand. Another question that came in was about the space program. What are we going to do to jumpstart the space program? Well, of course, it's very dangerous to have a space program with... It's very dangerous to have a space program that is totally dependent upon Russia. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought that at the height of the Cold War, that the space race would end with us hitchhiking a ride on Soviet booster rockets. Well, it sounded like a great idea, save money, right? But there's a problem there. And that problem is what happens if Russia invades Crimea. <laughs> well, yes, there is gonna be problems because Russia has a stranglehold on our manned space program. We depend on their Soyuz booster rockets to give us access to outer space, and we're not ready. We mothballed the shuttle. There is no more shuttle. The replacement for the shuttle is the Constellation. That was canceled. President Obama canceled the shuttle. He canceled the Constellation. He canceled the moon mission, and he canceled the Mars mission. It was a grand slam for the manned space program. Well, hopefully, we can bring down the cost of space travel. In all fairness, we should mention that Obama has bet on the commercialization of outer space to bring down the cost. For example, for you to go into outer space right now, if you were to suddenly go on a Soyuz booster rocket to orbit the Earth, near Earth orbit, how much would it cost? $10,000 a pound. That is your weight in gold. Think of your body made out of solid, gold and that's what it costs to put you in orbit around the planet earth so we have to have a cheaper way of getting into outer space so the commercialization of the space program may help because that of course will have competition will have competition hopefully to drive down the cost but eventually perhaps late in this century i hope that we have a space elevator a space elevator is like the beanstalk from Jack and the Beanstalk. You literally climb up, you climb up an elevator into heaven, a gateway to heaven. It obeys the laws of physics, but you can calculate that a space elevator's cable will snap if it's made out of steel. Think of a ball on a string. If I have a ball on a string, it doesn't fall down. Why doesn't it fall down? It doesn't fall down because the centrifugal force and centripetal force balance out. 
That's why a ball does not fall down. 